have Tom Batchelder, the author of Soldier Boy, Lewis Bromfield Letters Home from World War I, 1917 to 1919. Um, the book um, is available on Amazon. It is available at the uh, Malabar Farm gift shop and also malabarfarm.org, which is the foundation website. Uh, most of the letters that Mr. Batchelder is going to talk about tonight have never been seen um, in person uh, or talked about for over 100 years. So we're very excited to listen to his story. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Tom Batchelder. This is a, an entirely new experience for me. I've never talked to a computer before. So I'm gonna just pretend that you're all sitting out there in front of me. Uh, I'm guessing since you signed up for this that most of you or all of you have at least heard of Lewis Bromfield. Uh, in, in his lifetime from the 1920s through the 1950s, he was one of the most famous authors in the country and he's pretty much forgotten now, unfortunately. When I first started looking at uh, one letter in particular that we knew of that Bromfield had written because it had been published in the, in the Mansfield newspaper uh, a, a few years ago, I got to looking and seeing if there were other letters that he had written home because we had heard that his mother had uh, seen that many of his letters were published in the newspapers of the day. Uh, this would be 1918 primarily, 1919, 1918 during the war years. And we found out that there were a number of them available, probably letters that hadn't been seen for a hundred years uh, with one exception. And I thought it might be interesting and, and valuable and worth time preserving these letters in a book. So that's why I put this together here. Uh, Lewis Bromfield was born in Mansfield on uh, December 27th, 1896. He graduated from Mansfield High School in, uh, on June 6th of 1914. And by 1916, uh, late 1916, he was attending Columbia University uh, studying journalism. Did not like it there. Said his professors weren't teaching him anything. In fact, in one, uh, one thing that he wrote, he referred to them as a bunch of old grinds. So uh, by his second semester early in 1917, uh, he was a very unhappy student at Columbia. And uh, it was at that time, uh, fortuitous for him, that the uh, American Field Service came to Columbia recruiting students to drive ambulances for the French Army in the First World War. The war had actually started in 1914, just two months before Bromfield graduated from high school. So uh, they came to Columbia University recruiting for students. And Bromfield thought this was an excellent opportunity to go to France. He had been fa fascinated by the French people, the culture, the history of France, at least since high school. And this was his opportunity to get uh -huh. to France and see the country, even if it wasn't war. So he uh, signed up with the American Field Service Ambulance Corps. No sooner had he done that, though, than the United States declared war on Germany and became a participant with the Allies, with the British and the French, in the first what became known later as the First World War, the Great War. And Bromfield was a private, uh, became a private uh, kind of through the back door. And uh, for the first, so this was a, this would have been roughly April, around April of uh, 1917. And uh, for the first eight months up through December, he stayed stateside either training as an ambulance driver or just waiting to be shipped overseas. That did not really occur until uh, almost the end of December in 1917. Uh, he did send some letters home at that time though, and that's where we'll start, where, where we'll start with this right here, uh, talking about his letters. I at first thought I would just make casual references to the letters, and then the more I thought about it, I thought the more interesting it would be to actually read some of the more interesting excerpts from some of the letters. So that's what I'm going to do here, read some of those excerpt, ex, ex, excerpts. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, I think it's kind of interesting that most people don't know, in the, uh, in the book here I have a 
chapter one, or not actually chapter one, it's right below, right across from the timeline, a note on the spelling of a name. Lewis Bromfield, the way he became famous as an author was not the way his name was really spelled. Uh, it's spelled on his books, L-O-U-I-S-B-R-O-M-F-I-E-L-D. On his birth certificate, the Lewis is the English spelling, L-E-W-I-S, and his last name is Brumfield, not Bromfield. Uh, for a long time, the story was that, well, the publisher of his first novel accidentally spelled his name the wrong way, and so he changed it because it was a best-selling book. Well, we found out by looking at these First World War letters that even in the First World War, as early as 1918, he was experimenting with spelling his name. There's one letter in particular where he uh, concludes the name with Lewis Bromfield with an O, but then uh, on the return address on the letter, he spelled it with a U. So at that point, six years before his earliest novel was published, he was already experimenting with the change, name change. So if you look up Lewis Bromfield's birth certificate and look it up under his novelist name, you'll never find his birth certificate. Uh, so uh, I, I mentioned that in, uh, 1917, while he was still stateside, he did write letters home, and his mother saw that many of these letters were published in the local papers. So on, uh, and I thought what I would do, rather than just try to summarize some of these letters, is actually read some of it, read some of the letters or excerpts from some of the letters from what he had to say. So this is from chapter three in the book called Lewis Bromfield, 1917, Stirring Times. On the 20th of 19, on the, April 20th of 1917, the Mansfield Shield published an article titled Local Boy in New York City tells of conditions in Gotham where he is drilling with university students. Uh, and he uh, starts here. Dear family, I'm so glad I'm alive at these stirring times. Think of all the history taking place in the past two weeks. This is right after the United States had declared war on Germany. Uh, this, this I found kind of amusing here. Uh, it's great sport to wear my uniform. All the police speak to me. I read free. Or I ride free everywhere, and the ladies constantly smile at me. Uh, the, the the way he ended this letter, though, was not quite so pleasant. The funniest and I don't know, funniest is kind of an odd word to use, but it's his word. The funniest and most pathetic thing happened yesterday. When I left Frank's yesterday, uh, uh, Frank was a, a young man named Frank Meyer. One of the problems Bromfield had when he was at Columbia is his family did not have a lot of money and he had to work, uh, work part time, which stressed him out with all of his studies. So that was, that was one of the problems he had uh, as a student there. But Frank uh, was his, he was, a, he was Frank's tutor. And he, so he worked for the, for the Meyer family. And one of the later letters he actually wrote to the Meyer family that I'll address later. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about Frank or the Meyer family. So the funniest and most pathetic thing happened yesterday. When I left Frank's, I went to the corner to get Mrs. M some oranges. When I brought them back, I took them to the service entrance. The cook is a German. And when she saw me in uniform, she burst into hyster hysterical crying. Oh, don't kill me and my children, I'm German. Uh, don't, please don't, don't arrest us. She kept crying that way for some time before I could assure her that I was only Frank's tutor and meant her no harm. The poor woman was frightfully wrought up though. She said she had two brothers still in Germany and now that the other in this country would have to go overseas and shoot his brothers. So uh, he refers to that as a funny and pathetic uh, happening. I don't know, what, I, I didn't find it particularly funny when I read it. Uh, a second letter closer to the time he uh, did go overseas, uh, was uh, published in the Mansfield newspaper on the November 13th, and it's called Taking Lanterns Along to Bed. Uh, Dear family, we are now camped at, po po camp at Mount Pocono, one of the highest points in Pennsylvania. It is a beautiful, beautiful spot, but there is no breeze blowing in all of Pennsylvania, which is not, does not sweep across the top of these mountains. I'm convinced of that. We are in the summer barracks of a field artillery range and are quite stoveless. There are plenty of cracks in the floor, but there are plenty of blankets, so I'm not uncomfortable. But the sections from the South do suffer. Uh, there are boys here from Georgia whose teeth have not stopped rattling since we reached 1500 feet. Uh, all the overseas sections are up here now. Each section has 45 men, 20 ambulances, a Ford touring car, 
two motorcycles and sidecars and a Packard truck. All of the kitchen tray, also a kitchen trailer, which follows the truck and makes soup and wrap. Fortunately for Bromfield, when he did, uh, when he was back, kind of went through the back door into becoming a private in the United States Army during the wartime, uh, he did continue to serve as an ambulance driver and his unit was assigned to the French Army. So as he had hoped, he did drive an ambulance eventually for the French Army, even though he was a United States Army soldier at the time. Uh, so he continues here. I was in New York on Sunday last and the city was overrun with soldiers and sailors. 13,000 men came in from Camp Upton uh, alone to spend the weekend. There are a great many near the city and all overseas troops are quartered in Tenafly, New Jersey, just across the Hudson, pending their departure for the other side. It really actually wouldn't be until almost mid-1918 before the bulk of the United States Army arrived in France. Uh, but Bromfield was there well ahead of them. He was one of the earlier of the uh, official American soldiers in France for the First World War. Uh, chapter two then, uh, or chapter four rather, deals with the letters that he sent home during the war. And it's titled Louis Bromfield 1918 to win a war. Uh, and this is my own writing here. Lewis finally left the United States for France on December 26th, 1917, one day before his 21st birthday. He arrived on the French coast 18 days later on January 13th, 1918. It's kind of interesting. It took him 18 days to get across the Atlantic, but when he returned home in 1919, it only took 13 days. And I was reading about that, and it was primarily because of the troop transports zigzagging across the ocean, trying to avoid uh, German submarines, which were sinking a lot of ships at the time, even during the First World War. So uh, this, this kind of disturbed me when I read it the first time. So I, I, I wrote this to kind of uh, address it. Many of the 1918 letters that Louis Bromfield wrote uh, home read almost as though he was on a delightful vacation in France. Even as the year unfolded and the fighting intensified and Lewis found himself driving an ambulance on the front lines, his writing continued to vacillate between descriptions of the horror he was witnessing and dispassionate, dispassionate, dispassionately discla declaring that, quote, I'm having the time of my life and wouldn't miss it for the world. Uh, so he sent the following letter here. This is one of his earliest ones from France, uh, dated, February 18th, 1918. This was to the Meyer family, his employers in New York when he was at Columbia. Uh, Dear family, I have been very busy the last few days and we have moved again in, and we have moved again in the bargain. I have had to be a bit neglectful of my mail. Things are going beautifully now. We have very excellent quarters, real beds, mattresses, and a handsome, in a handsome old abbey. The abbey and church are very old, having been started by Pippin the Short in 900 and erected on the ruins of an old Roman amphitheater. The people in the town are splendid to us and extremely hospitable. Bromfield does not, uh, does not identify the town. Uh, in fact, he was not allowed to. In a number of the letters he wrote here, I'm gonna have to, re I'm gonna have to reference censored because he uh, had, had, had those marked out by his lieutenant apparently. So he was never able to identify exactly where he was at in the war. Uh, and so, he, so he continues here. This is a very delightful experience for me, and you may believe that, that I am making the most of it. We are assembling our ambulances now and will leave here sometime soon, according to present indications. Our hopes run toward Paris, of course, at least for a few days, but, no, no one, never know, but one never knows the destination until one arrives. Uh, I have no idea where we go, when we will go up front, but uh, no, it will be before long. Just now I am working as company clerk and as I am more fitted for that than for setting up motors. It also gave him a little bit more free time, I think, based on what he said later. Uh, there is so much that I should like to tell you, but which I am forbidden until I get back. Uh, God knows when. Uh, we'll all have a good time. I am yours ever. Lewis Bromfield, Section 577, United States Army Ambulance Service. It's important that the 577 was his unit and, and that does play into something that's very important later on in identifying uh, uh, some of his experiences. Uh, on April 21st, 1918, the Mansfield Shield ran a 
uh, a headline story from a letter of Brumfield that said, Mansfield soldier boy delights with France. Louis Brumfield, they were calling him Brumfield at the time, tells of the hospitality of people, quote, over there, describes ride on a railroad train with soldiers of different nations. So this is actually, he wrote it on March 3rd, but it wasn't published until April 21. Looking at a lot of these, it seemed like they were on average five to six weeks from the time he wrote them before they actually got published in the paper. So this one here, Dear Ones All, the book that Marie, that's Louis Bromfield's uh, younger sister, Marie, older sister, excuse me, older sister, she was 10 years older than him. Uh, the book from Marie came tonight. I have been reading it and it is certainly a peach. London's dog stories are by far his best. And this is a good one. The boys in the section hailed it hailed it with shouts of delight. Of course, Jack London is very popular here and this particular story is well known. Uh, this Sunday, I have certainly had a delightful day. We were given permission to go to the neighboring town of Censored. Uh, it, is quite it is a quite large place and very interesting. Uh, we, were quite, we were all quite the center of things all day long. I made some valuable purchases, some excellent maps of France and all of Europe so that I am able to follow developments pretty thoroughly. Fortunately, the sergeant is a person of considerable brains and enjoys watching this big mess working itself out. Neither of us is losing an opportunity to gain everything possible. And as I am clerk, we have a great deal of time and study things out together. I have obtained three handsome posters from uh, about three by four foot advertising the French national loan. The Ministry of Finance gave them to me and we are using them in our office. It used to be the sitting room of the abbot until the abbey was abandoned. Our desk where I do my work is by a tall French window, uh, which looks out into the country yard uh, through the flying buttresses of the old church. Uh, he goes on here, and they actually inserted kind of a, like a little subtitle in the newspaper here, American Troops Pass, in the article. And so he continues here, while we were waiting at Censored uh, for our train back, a troop train passed through filled with American soldiers. They were the first ones we'd seen for some time, and we were certainly, uh, and we certainly gave them a rousing welcome, especially after I found they were from Indiana. We came back in the same compartment with a British Red Cross corporal, two French soldiers, two German prisoners, and three Americans, some crew. I rather pity the poor Boches. Uh, they seemed to be out of the conversation and did not seem very intelligent. It must be very embarrassing to be a prisoner. Uh, we saw scores of East Indian troops of the British Empire in censored. Who could miss all this? Certainly I can't afford, uh, certainly I can't afford to. This is the sort of thing which I was anxious to come to France. As you can see, I'm skipping an awful lot here. So you'll have to buy the book to get the whole letter. Uh, I, have a, I have a picture of myself taken in front of the Abbey by, by one of the villagers. I wish I could send it, but it would be nabbed without much doubt. And so it joins the vast collections of things which I will have to show you and talk to you about when I return. I am well, I like this part. I am well known in the village and here the, and I'm, and I'm referred to by the various titles of Monsieur Louis, Le Grand Blonde and Monsieur Le Secretary. Uh, there's a vast amount more that I could tell you, but I must really stop this time for the poor Lieutenant's sake. That was the censor. Uh, he goes on again here then uh, in a letter that he wrote on March. The following letter, Bromfield, uh, the following letter, the following Lewis Bromfield letter, unfortunately incomplete, was posted on March 8, 1918. This one was not part of the newspaper. Uh, it was in a, uh, no, I don't have it written down here. It was in a library, that, uh, I think New York City Historical Library. So his History Society Library, something like that that I found. But anyway, it's addressed to a Miss Edith Braun, uh, which I, uh, New York, uh, 44th East 76th Street, New York City, uh, New York, USA. I can only assume and I, I, I presume that she must have been a friend of his that he met while he was going to school in Columbia. Uh, unfortunately, the letter's not complete. Uh, what I find most interesting in it were, was when he wrote here, financially, I am the Morgan of the section. I did not allow myself to be swindled into taking liberty bonds or allotments as this service, his ambulance service, seems to be quite, risk, uh, quite riskless. And then in parentheses he includes here, much to my chagrin after my boasting of all the casualties while in the States. 
uh, insurance is unnecessary. So I draw full pay, 214 francs per month. The natives about here are overcome at that fact. Considering that I'm touring France with board and room paid, I have plenty of money. I keep that, uh, that quote there, uh, uh, touring France, uh, board and, uh, room and board, board and room paid. Keep that in mind. I, uh, I must close as the lieutenant must be worn out. Uh, God pity the man, you know, he's our censor. Give my best to all the family. Uh, send me, a, excuse me, send me a line. Uh, ever votre petite, your little one, Louis Bromfield. Now, uh, where he wrote, touring France with room and board paid. Again, almost as though he's on some kind of a vacation. Uh, that kind of came to an abrupt halt quickly. And in the uh, National Archives in Washington, D.C., there's uh, some documents about the uh, Columbia Ambulance Unit 577, Bromfield's unit. So I included these here, although they're not a letter from him, uh, but they do give uh, a good indication of the kind of experience he was having at this point. Uh, so Lewis's lighthearted, quote, tour of France with room and board paid, unquote, soon came to an end. Uh, in a May 1918 newspaper article from the New York Times titled Columbia Ambulance Unit that is preserved at the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington begins uh, a report on the work of the Columbia University Ambulance Corps during the April drive in Flanders has been received by a Lieutenant Worthington whose son Everett is a member, in, 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 is a member of that unit. Uh, the men went over in December of 1917 their work is in carrying out the wounded from battlefields to hospitals and way stations was of the most dangerous type. Now, that report that is referred to there in the newspaper, I did get from the archives, uh, and I'm only going to read a couple sections of it here. It's a, it's a long report, but it does give some indication of the kind of experience Bromfield was having. Uh, it's called the Report on the Work of uh, Sanitary Service Unit 577 Bromfields between April 24 and April 30th, 1918. That was part of what was referred to as the German Spring Offensive uh, that went from April through July in Belgium. Basically the last German attempt at, at winning the war. So this is what this, re this report was actually uh, prepared by a General Sicard. It doesn't give any other information about him, but this is what he has to write about, uh, about this unit, Bromfields unit. The American sanitary automobile section is composed of 20 Fords, each with a maximum of five men seated or three lined. Now I think they mean uh, beyond the drivers. There's, there were usually two drivers. So these were, would be injured men. Uh, though their small capacity does not permit large evacuations, on the other hand, their lightness permits them to go over rough roads, even at times across fields and to approach as near as possible the front lines. Uh, it is above all a formation for the front. Uh, see here, the drivers are obliged to make dangerous trips with their masks on continually because of the uh, gas attacks over a road violently bombarded uh, both by shrapnel and gas shells. The evacuations continued normally until the demolishing and abandonment of the posts, uh, the front line first aid stations uh, to the extent to that to an extent and that and that the, the two machines stationed at the post of the 83rd uh, Infantry Regiment were smashed into bits by shells, and one of those stationed at West Dutre suffered the same fate. So they had to be very close to the front. Some of their ambulances were being blown apart. Uh, it was therefore in advance, uh, referring again to Section 577, it was therefore in the advanced section only in the most dangerous part of the evacuation trip that the drivers of five, SSU 577 operated. Uh, several staying at the wheels 24 hours without an instant's rest and without the slightest nourishment. Several of them were forced to abandon their machines, rendering useless, rendered useless by shell fire and to come back on foot through the bombardment. The number of wounded evacuated by SSU 577 was 2,271, the majority of these being from the first aid posts to the triage, in other words, the most dangerous part of the journey. Of the 20 machines, 13 had been more or less damaged by shell fire, the seven others badly strained by the bad condition of the roads and will not be able to continue service until serious repairs have been made. Uh, when one thinks that these men 
when one thinks that these men had accomplished their missions with gas masks continuously on, on a road the aspect of which changed every trip due to its being encumbered by the debris of material and shell holes barring the road and without allowing themselves to be distracted for an instant by the breaking of shells, each being a menace of death, one cannot but admire the coolness of which they gave proof of and which their compatriots rightly may be proud one dead driver and two wounded were the ransom for their heroism. And then that was signed by uh, General Sicard. So uh, those were the kind of things Bromfield was doing. Uh, he doesn't write a lot about some of the things he saw, but I think that gives a good indication that he was uh, many times right in the middle of it. So on July 9th then, under the heading of, was in the thick of fighting during the big German offensive, the Mansfield News published excerpts from several letters that Bromfield wrote home. It was kind of hard to separate which letters belonged to which dates, but I did figure out one of them uh, was dated May 14th, 1918. And in that he writes, the people in the little chateau where we have quartered are fine to us and we have the run of the place. Yesterday afternoon, I went through the house and read the names of German officers who were quartered here for one night in September of 1914. Von Kluck himself occupied the largest chamber. The name of the officers are written in pencil over each door and are quite legible. Over mine is Profius, one of the German Latin names one hears so often among the Prussians. I do not imagine the rest was very tranquil on that night for it was that fateful date of the turning of the Battle of the Marne. Uh, this was the furthest point reached by the Germans when von Kluck's right wing was turned and the retreat, retreat of the German army began. Moving on now to a letter that Bromfield wrote on June 8th that wasn't published until July 20th. Uh, they had the, the newspaper headed it, direct from the scene of action, letter tells of incidents of war. Uh, Louis Bromfield in service with the United States Ambulance Corps attached to the French army. And this is what he had to say there. France, June 8, 1918. We have had another very busy time for the past two weeks with no chance to write letters. You can see where we are in at it. What you can see when we are in it at the front, one only has time to eat and sleep and not enough of that. Of course, you know what we have been in for. The newspapers have been full of it. A retreat, you know, is much less work and much more interesting than an advance. Uh, at one time, Bill and I, and the car, I think he means his ambulance, lost the convoy and crept along behind an artillery train. The Germans had been dropping bombs on the road ahead and behind us, one of their new tactics, and suddenly two planes swooped alongside the road, firing on us with machine guns. The two planes hovered between us and the moon like vultures. You can see where he, you can see the, the drama in him already that he's going to be a fiction writer. Uh, he's going to be a writer. So uh, the two planes hovered between us and the moon like vultures, while every man lay flat on the ground and tried to hide or tried to hide in a field of deep clover. Uh, to add to the wildness of the scene, an aeroplane hangar had taken fire and lit up the countryside for miles around. Further on, at the entrance of a beech forest, a bomb had dropped beside the road. When we came by, there were four dead horses. Uh, uh, fallen in gross positions, one on its knees, another with four feet stretched helplessly in the air, another horse not yet dead lay kicking in the ditch and everywhere pools of blood. That was one of the things I, I found fascinating, if that's the right word for it, about the First World War. They had all of this modern equipment, siege guns and machine guns and airplanes and bombs, and yet they were still heavily dependent on horses. I remember reading someplace where there were something like 15 million horses died during the, during the, the uh, First World War. They hauled their artillery and horses oftentimes and even uh, had to use them uh, as uh, uh, for hauling baggage or uh, any kind of supplies or anything like that. Horses were still very important in spite of it being considered the first modern warfare. Uh, he goes on here then, uh, and everywhere pools of blood. By the side of the road lay three, I, this gets me every time I read it. Uh, by the side of the road lay three dead men in a neat row in the moonlight, one without a face. Uh, from then on for the next few days, we continued dropping back and back, sometimes two and three times a day, just beyond the reach of the Germans. We stopped for two days in censored, 
uh, a large town which went into a panic when the order was given to evacuate. The square was filled with men, women, children, and wheelbarrows, dog carts, bundles, and everywhere wounded and dusty, dusty soldiers, French and British straggling back. Uh, this continues, this is part of that same collection of letters that were all uh, published together. At Censored, uh, we spent the night in the same forest with a German scouting party of 60 who were captured in the morning by the French artillery. We have been quite close, we had been quite close to them all along. Uh, this sort of warfare, however, is much more preferable to the kind we had up north. It is much, I much prefer machine guns and rifles to shrapnel barrages and gas. A bullet does not make the ugly wound of an eclat, which is a shard of a shell. You can imagine a shell bursting apart and send, well, like a grenade now, you think of all the little pieces that get sent flying out. Apparently those were, those were quite commonly used in the war. Let's see here, he moves on here in July. Uh, the, in, on July 9th, 1918, the Mansfield News ran an article titled, when in the thick of, uh, was in the thick of fighting during big German offense. And he writes here, uh, we have seen practic all, this is Bromfield writing again, we have seen practic all of it, practically all of it. I wish you could be, I wish you could hear the cannonading now. A Bosch plane is in sight and all the aircraft guns have gone wild. As near as I can describe it, uh, it is the noise, the noise of the shells going overhead sounds like as if all of the heavens have, had been ripped open. We've not been out of it under shell for the past 10 days, not even to sleep. We have certainly worked hard. Our division also served at Verdun during the Crown Prince's attack. And there the men without exception say the last five days have been the hottest they have ever been in. I know now what a barrage is. It is kind of, it, it, it's bad enough to scare you to death even if nothing touches you. Uh, the powerful Katrinka, that was this, his uh, pet name or his nickname for his ambulance. The powerful Katrinka and I have been through one, a barrage, and Katrinka has several shrapnel holes and one piece of shrapnel permanently lodged in her water tank. Uh, yesterday, there was a wild activity. The airplanes were fighting all day in the sky and the English brought down two Germans about a mile from us. It was fascinating to watch like the fighting of hawks and the anti-aircraft guns all about us popping shrapnel at them. Uh, same, same thing keeps up all night. The guns roar about us and the shells scream over us in the sky. Uh, on the uh, on June twenty second, Lewis wrote wrote another letter home. However, it wasn't published in the news in the Mansfield Shield until August eighteenth. Again, uh, almost about six weeks later, five weeks later, uh, and this one was titled "Army Life in a French Village After Civilians Have Departed." Uh, and Bromfield writes, "Dear one and all." I have not had any mail for several days from America, but this morning received a large packet of Times and Tribune supplements, su and tri Tribune supplements. Very welcome and greatly enjoyed by all of us. The boys like them better than anything else. And then it is funny to see how America fights the war in a supplement, uh, which is about as far from reality as it can possibly be. Some things don't change. Uh, there's a couple of interesting stories he relates here. I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, uh, they're kind of telling. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through a couple of them here. Uh, at Censored, I made the acquaintance, uh, acquaintance of a very delightful French woman who has charge of the Foyer des Soldats, which is, uh, as you know, is uh, sort of like our YMCA. She is the wife of a professor from the Sorbonne University in Paris and took the chair in France at Glasgow University when her husband was mobilized in 1914 and unable to take the place. As there was but one trip a day, I spent a great deal of time with her and certainly enjoyed talking about good books. She is an intrepid woman and stayed by her post with the soldiers in Censored uh, when the place was nearly shelled about her ears. For the last 10 days, she was compelled to sleep in a dugout in a hillside every night. And then later on, he uh, writes here, Yesterday in the heart of the forest, we came suddenly upon a rude cross from the branches of a tree. On it was carved in French, a German soldier, 1914. 
These lonely graves from 1914 are one of the sights which seem to me the most pathetic. I can't help but wonder what sort of chap this boy was and how he came into the war. And I always think he might have enjoyed living as much as I do. Uh, one comes on the graves here and there where the poor boys have fallen, sometimes beside the road, sometimes in the square of a village and, or in the heart of a forest. The French graves are almost always covered with a tri with a tricolor, their flag, waving over the grave and sometimes spurs, a sword, or even a battered helmet. And the German graves are usually bare, although sometimes a French soldier leaves a bunch of flowers on, on one, a bunch of wildflowers on them. Uh, the woman he was referring to in that letter that he did, or in that part of the letter that he didn't identify was actually, uh, her name was uh, Valette. I think that's the way it's pronounced in French. Uh, and so he writes here, uh, she related a story to him that I thought was worth repeating here too. <clears throat> uh, from uh, Madame Vallette comes to me the story of a French family absolutely wrecked by the war. It is typical of what the poor country has gone through. She told me of the family of the director of the Louvre in Paris. It has been one of the, it had been one of the happiest before the war with two of the daughters married well and a third to be married to a brilliant young writer. Uh, in Paris. Then came the war and the two husbands and the fiance were called up. In the first days of fighting, there were two men killed in the fiance's regiment and he was one of them. Six months later, the husband of one of the women was killed and the husband of the third badly wounded. The youngest daughter still remained the cheer and hope of the family and kept them up above everything. On Good Friday, she left the house to go to church and did not return. The next morning they found her in the morgue. She had been one of those killed when a shell from a German siege gun struck the church. Think what a wreck is left of that happy family and it's only one of many. On uh, June 27th, Bromfield wrote uh, in an article that was also published uh, titled In the Shade of the Lilies of France. Uh, Dear ones all, this is really a letter from the front. Just over the hill are the Germans and down the road are breaking the big Bosch 77 shells. I'll have to go through them in a few minutes. I am sitting in the backyard of a big farm against a wall in the shade of some lilacs. And in the midst of all of this, I hear I am listening to the loveliest of music. A French Lieutenant is playing Debussy's Claire de Lune on a piano that somehow has escaped destruction. Believe me, it sounds good. The little town must have been very beautiful, but it is entirely demolished now. The garden is full of shell holes, but against the wall are some glorious sweet peas, lovelier, excuse me, lovelier than any we have ever raised. At the end of the garden are 37 new graves, the result of one evening's skirmish. Uh, they, have brought, they have just brought in a wounded Bosch German pr prisoner. Yesterday, I took two of them to censored. Uh, it was a long, hard ride through a good, very beautiful country. I must say the Bosch soldiers I have seen are very stupid. Uh, not the officers who, are, uh, who seem very keen. Perhaps that is the secret of the German government's ability to make dupes of the German people. Uh, and then he writes here, the music in the farmhouse still continues interrupted by shells. Let's see, I'm gonna skip that one. Um, on August 8th, 1918, Bromfield or Lewis sent another letter to his friend in, uh, Edith in New York. And uh, he writes there, uh, dear Edith, we have just been through the thick, we, we have just been through the attack which is progressing so successfully now. In fact, we began it, our division. Uh, for days, the French prepared for, prepared for the attack, sending in thousands of shells and hundreds of guns. All of this made our work very difficult for the roads were not too good and all of the bridges were made of boats and constantly bombarded. I happened to be on post when the word came that the barrage was to start in five minutes. After 10 days of waiting and expectations, our nerves were well keyed up for the attack and you may well believe that the five minutes seemed like a century. It came with a great explosion, gradually gaining in intensity until the valley roared and flashed with guns. In short order, I had a load of uh, gas victims 
and was off down the narrow streets of the villages, dodging escadron after escadron of cavalry galloping furiously up the cobblestone, uh, cobblestone road, still using cavalry with their lances in the First World War. I can't describe the effect, but it was like a crescendo of a vast orchestra. And the other, pla other plateau, one, on, on the other plateau, one could see a wall of flames. In a few hours, we were advancing and the ambulances following the infantry very closely all the way across fields plowed by shells and mines, sometimes through fields and literally over villages. In one, one village I went through, it was demolished beyond belief. It is exact to say that one, not one stone remained on another and very often the wrecks were simply dust. Nothing but cellars remained and they were badly damaged. Uh, uh, on October 15th, we're getting close to the end of the war here. On October 15th, Lewis wrote another letter to Edith. Uh, very good letter written on your 18th birthday received uh, some days ago and believe it was welcome. It was, it was welcome, the first mail I had in nearly two weeks. Uh, where I came from, we were thankful for a five minutes respite, respite from shells to dash through. For this, this, is, this is important too here. For days we have been waiting to hear the news that the last cannon has been fired. The past month has been one of pathetic anxiety for my division, for they are almost all from the north of France. The poor fellows stand before the communiques for hours waiting to hear that their village has been has fallen into our hands. They turn and say, ah, la Cateau is fallen. That was my village. My sister and brother, my, my mother and sister have been there for four years. Perhaps I'll see them. Now I have seen all of Alsace. I have seen the Western Front, all of the Western Fronts, Amin, Reims, Houston, uh, the Marne, and many others, and many other towns. I have carried Germans and Australians and Belgians and French and British and Americans and Arabs and Senegalese living in the same houses with the Foreign Legion. Lived, uh, and I lived in Paris with all of the world. Uh, there are a lot of plans I should like to talk over with you but I, when I come home uh, for a short, short time, but I am sure of returning to France for I feel it is a loss not to perfect my French while I have made such a good and decent start of it. Lots of love, old, old dear, give my, he, he's talking to an 18 or 19 year old girl. Lots of love, old dear, uh, give my best to St. John, the Lawrences and all the crew. May we all be together soon. Good night, ever your pal, Lewis. Uh, the secession of the war that Bromford was looking forward to uh, did come a short time later, less than a month later. On Monday, November 11th, 1918, the New York Herald or the New York Times headline announced armistice signed end of war Berlin seized by revolutionaries new chancellor begs for order ousted Kaiser flees to Holland the war ends at six o'clock this morning and uh Bromfield does give a little bit of information here about his experiences right at that time at the end of the war I'm not going to read all of them here but I like this part here uh I left Paris on the Lyon Express early next morning with a French aviator and an infantry sergeant, both just out of the hospital. Uh, we had a jolly time awaiting ex expectantly the news of the signing of the armistice. The news finally came to us in a most dramatic fashion. The express was roaring through a tunnel, black as hell itself, and when suddenly out of the blackness, we heard shouts of la victory, la victory, we rushed to the corridors and outside in the blackness broke, broken only by the lanterns uh, were a party of territorials, the old men of the French army who were mending the roadbed. Uh, some of them were weeping and crying, the victory, the victory, the peace, the peace. From that moment on, it was a triumphal march for all Americans. Uh, the streets were in, at Dijon, the streets were full of people, old women, soldiers, babies, children, all parading and singing songs, all wearing flowers and expressions of joy that are in, indescribable. Let's see. I think I'm going to skip those two. That's not. Oh, this, this is kind of interesting here. He wrote one last letter to his friend Edith. Uh, yesterday was my birthday, 22 years old, only a couple, now this is, this is December 28, 1918, so this is after the war. This may have been the last letter he wrote in 1918. 
Uh, yesterday was my birthday, 22 years old, only a couple of years older than you, and I'm still bumming about not knowing what I want to do. My latest wild scheme is to come back here and to go into French aviation when I'm de demobilized. That would furnish me a life with some excitement, a chance to read and write as much as I like, and put me in touch with people worth knowing. I would perfect my French and, uh, and see a lot of things worthwhile, not to mention the gorgeous uniform I'd wear. What do you think? Please tell me. The last letter that I have here is the one that has been published in the last few decades in the Mansfield News. And it, I know a number of people have copies of it. Uh, it's to his cousin. It was actually published, uh, let's see here. Well, it's actually originally published January 19th, 1919. Uh, or that's when he wrote it. I shouldn't say it wasn't published. Apparently this one was not published. Uh, it's to his cousin, uh, Leila. Dear cousin Leila, there is nothing to write from this country now. Life goes on very monotonously, much more now because we have lived at such, at such a speed for the past year. I wonder how easy it will be for us to settle down at, at a steady routine again. At present, I am shuffling about this dirty Lorraine village in a big pair of wooden shoes. They are extremely practical where there is mud and cold and remarkably comfortable. When I will be home is uncertain. Our division has been broken up and our general, who is one of the most spectacular of French political intriguers, has gone back to the Chamber of Deputies. In a few days, we are going to Metz and after that, in all probability to Versailles, where we will stay some time. That will be interesting on account of the peace conference. It is a wonderful old town. I stayed there 15 days in March. And uh, he concludes it by saying, uh, I sent you a Christmas card from Strasbourg, a real German Christmas card. The bookstores there are wonderful and the cards the most beautiful I have ever seen. I can't help admiring German art more and more every day. Lots of love and right soon, your cousin, Louis Bromfield. Uh, Bromfield ended up staying in France in the army until he was, uh, until he returned home. Oh, it, he stayed a total of one year, four months, and 11 days before he was finally uh, sent home and uh, discharged on June 11th, 1919. In several of his letters, he wrote about his intent to, to return to the continent, especially to France, as soon as he could after he was discharged. Uh, that actually took another six years. Uh, Bromfield, he did go back to France though. Bromfield went to New York after he was discharged, and I, I'm speculating that because of the resume he had with his mother's having published, gotten many of his letters published in the newspapers, he quickly found work with several news services in New York and eventually uh, got a job as a night editor with Associated Press. He became an advertising manager with Putnam Publishing. Uh, he was on the original staff of Time Magazine. So uh, for six years, he did a lot of different kinds of jobs, some of them simultaneously. In 1921, he met a young woman named uh, Mary Appleton Wood, the daughter of a prominent New York lawyer named Chalmers Wood, and they were married nine months later in September of 1921. 1924, Bromfield's first daughter was born, Anne, and that same year he had his first novel published, The Green Bay Tree. And it was a, it was a critical, uh, critical success in a best-selling book. Uh, the second year, 1925, he had a second novel published titled Possession, and it even outsold his first book. So by this point, he had quit all of the other jobs he was doing so he could just write exclusively and decided to fulfill that dream he had of returning to France. So uh, in 1925, late 1925, they did go back to France, ended up living there for 13 years. Uh, the first several years they stayed in hotels and apartments in Paris and then decided they wanted something more permanent. So they took out a long-term lease on an ancient town called saint lee about 25 or 30 miles northwest of Paris and he settled into, into life there. Uh, unfortunately, by 1938, Bromfield could see another war on the horizon, knew it was coming, and uh, knew he wanted to get out before he had to do it in a hurry. So he sent his family back in November of 1938, back to Ohio, and then a short time later followed them. In January, to fulfill a dream he had always had, uh, inspired by his, uh, his maternal grandfather's farm, Bromfield always wanted to have his own farm. So it, he had the resources at that point. By that time, there had been 
uh, half a dozen Hollywood movies made from his novels and short stories. He had had 17, 16 or 17 books published, many of them bestsellers. So he had the resources. In January of 1939, he started buying property in Southern Richland County and Malabar Farm was born. And of course now it's Malabar Farm State Park, still a working farm. It's been a working farm since Bromfield started it in 1939. And that's about it. Thank you if very we, much, Tom. If we have any time for questions, I'm up, up, up for them. And while we're looking at that, I just want to say that in addition to the um, places that I told you in the beginning of the program that the book is for sale, again, it's Soldier Boy, Lewis Bronfield, Letters from Letters Home from World War One. I'm sorry. Um, is also going to be available here at the library. We have multiple copies on order. And um, the recording for this presentation will be uploaded to our website tomorrow. Um, should be sometime tomorrow morning if you'd like to view it or have uh, share it with any of your friends or family, please do that. And uh, so now we'll take some questions if anybody has any. Clapping hands. I don't see any questions yet. No, but I'm getting some some shaking of heads. Um, I don't see anything in the chat. If you want to put it in the okay. chat, feel free to. Um, I don't see anything yet. So, Tom, thank you very much. Oh, I was pleased to do it. Wonderful, this, this wonderful a, gathering of information. And this was this was a new experience for me talking to a camera <laughs> rather than a group of people. You did a great job. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, thank you all. See you thank next you. time.